So my name is Shana Luna Alexander. Uh, I'm the Smart Justice Organizer at ACLU Hawaii. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And we're joined today. Uh, I guess if y'all want to introduce yourselves, make it easier. <laughs> on me. Okay, cool. I can start. Um, my name is Destiny Sherryon. I am the social justice advocate for Young Progressives Demanding Action, and I'm here today to help host and participate in this panel discussion about policing and what that looks like here in Hawaii and in our communities of color. Oh, okay. um, I'm Astro. Um, I'm a former inmate in the Hawaii correctional system that has paroled effectively and gotten out. Um, here to talk about my personal story and things that have happened with how everything broke down with uh, my case. Uh, Aloha mai kako. My name is Joy Lehonani Inamoto. I'm with the Council RIMPAC Coalition and I am also a kia'i of Mauna Kea. Um, and have been a long time um, advocate for uh, uh, out basically policing um, change, uh, transformation. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Thank you. So uh, before we begin, I think it's important for us to acknowledge what's happening around us. So I want Destiny um, talk a bit about that. So as many of you are aware, there are protests and demonstrations being done here in Hawaii and across the continental United States in response to another black life being taken by a police officer. Um, these people are employed to protect and serve us, the people. And um, unfortunately, that's not what's being happened. Uh, the death of George Floyd was just another call to action. Um, that's just a one name on a list of way too many. And so um, at ACLU, they have definitely taken on lots of cases that um, are against the use of excessive, of excessive, uh, excessive force by police officers in our communities. And there's still so much more that needs to be done. Um, so we are here today to talk about that. Um, it's really, really important to take a minute and just recognize uh, the lives that have been lost. Most recently, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and uh, countless others. So we're here today to not only give those names a space, um, but also to talk about what we do moving forward to help to prevent that from happening anymore. Thank you, Destiny. Black Lives Matter. So again, my name is Shana, and I'm the Smart Justice Organizer at ACLU Hawaii. Um, ACLU is the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, for nearly 100 years, the ACLU has been working in courts, legislatures, uh, and communities to defend and preserve uh, the individual rights and liberties that, that the Constitution and laws of the United States guarantee uh, everyone in this country. We've been serving Hawaii since 1965. We're a private nonprofit and nonpartisan organization. Uh, we don't take any government funding. And whether it's achieving full equality for LGBTQ people, establishing new privacy protections, um, ending mass incarceration, or preserving the right to vote, or right to have an abortion, ECLU takes up um, the toughest civil liberties cases and issues to defend all people from government uh, abuse and overreach. Um, and then here's a bit of a disclaimer. So at the ACLU, you know, we're widely known for our court battles, uh, but that's not my job. Um, I'm an organizer, a community builder, and listener, um, not an attorney. So much of the information provided uh, you can find in your pocket constitution or on our website aclu.org. Uh, if you personally have a legal uh, situation or you have a specific uh, question, uh, please visit aclu.org slash need dash legal dash help. Um, also, keep in mind if you're called, if you feel called to do participate in any action, um, there is a pandemic going on. Uh, so please, you know, remember to physically distance, wear a mask, wash your hands. There's a lot of demonstrations we're all called to participate in, but let's uh, care for one another. So the Smart Justice Campaign is part of a national initiative to decarcerate the nation in Hawaii by 50% while combating the racial disparities in the criminal legal system. That means we 
recognize far too many people in the US, namely Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. In Hawaii, this means Kanaka Maoli and Pacifica peoples are disproportionately policed, arrested, and incarcerated. Uh, we seek to empower people who have been directly impacted and our allies with the tools and resources to change the system, not only in the courtrooms, uh, but at our state legislature and in our communities. Uh, so in this presentation, we're going to go over um, some of those ways that we can see change and how you can help out with that. So when coming into a space of learning and growing, I think it's important to check in um, for the past couple of Fridays during the stay at home order, I've been hosting Pahana, um, Pahanas with uh, folks, some of our supporters. Um, and my favorite check in question is what are you looking forward to when all of this is over? Uh, for me, I'm looking forward to going back to the arcade. I really love pinball and um, first person shooter video games. And those are like high touch things that like you can't do right now. Um, so I just want to pay, play a quick video for you all about um, what some people are looking forward to when this is all over. When it's all over, I look forward to getting dressed, going to work, watching my son shoot basketball. I look forward to starting a garden with my five sugar babies, my grandchildren, to go to church again. My daughter, she wants to go to this water park in North Carolina. I'm a McDonald's and Burger King junkie. <laughs> I like um, just be able to go there. Every day, thing that we took for granted. I look forward to a pedicure. Just walking around in a mall, show the world my art. Um, Laying on the couch with my mom and my dad. There's so many things I want to do when I get out of here. Let's call it from a federal prison. First, I got to I gotta live through this situation. There's a lot of sick people in here, and nobody cares anymore. I have to survive. Got to survive in here. We are human. We've made mistakes, but that doesn't mean that our lives are any less valuable than the next person's. Sorry, technical difficulties. Cool. So I hope that that video helped in a small way to make uh, what we're talking about real. Uh, during the past three months, over 110,000 people have uh, in the US have died to COVID-19. For millions of incarcerated people, um, this means the threat of a death sentence. There's no such thing as social or physical distancing when you're incarcerated. Uh, the, our facilities are not equipped to handle an influx of disease and fail to provide even the most basic of healthcare, which means an overcrowded jail can quickly turn into an overcrowded hospital, like we've seen in Texas, Ohio, Michigan, Tennessee, New Jersey, and the list goes on. Fortunately, because Hawaii was vigilant and we had a number of public defenders and legal advocates, um, our detention centers have gotten off pretty easy um, compared to the continent. Every month, around 300 people uh, return on average prior pre pandemic uh, return to their families and communities because of COVID-19 precautions we've seen that number um, increase and help lessen some of the unsafe and unsanitary overcrowding that happens in Hawaii's prisons and jails um, and, and that way because we can't talk about policing uh, without talking about who we police and who are we currently incarcerating so between 1980 and 2017, Hawaii's uh, incarcerated population rose by four, over 400%. Um, in 2017, over 5,600 people are, were currently were incarcerated. And due to the overcrowding, again, unsafe and unsanitary conditions, um, 1,400 people were housed um, in a private prison in Arizona. Um, and a lot of these facts and figures are taken from our blueprint for smart justice that was published in 2019 and we pulled directly from the public safety's website and reports that they release. Uh, so at a glance, if we look at our population, many of the folks who are currently uh, who were incarcerated in 2018 were there because of a parole or probation violation. Uh, people were there detained or pretrial means they had not yet been uh, convicted of a crime um, and in uh, had a number of them had a charge or sentence for a property crime, which we know 
uh, is a lot of the times try, um, tied to um, substance abuse within the community. And the demographics, so 40% of, of people incarcerated um, in Hawaii um, identify as Native Hawaiian. 5% reported um, by the Public Safety Department um, identifies Black. Um, even though Black folks in Hawaii, you know, um, make around 2% of the population. Um, oh, and also naming that over 40% in Native Hawaiian, that's a huge statistic, knowing that uh, around 20% of people in Hawaii identify as Native Hawaiian. Uh, the number of women in Hawaii, uh, incarcerated in Hawaii, continues to grow. And we just have no data on LGBTQ people currently in the system. One of the things that's really important to name, you know, I just talked about some of like, did a very brief overview of some of the facts and the figures and the, that can be really boring, but I also want to like bring it home. Like why should we care around who is being incarcerated, who, who is being arrested and policed in our communities? And I think we have to talk about uh, that this is our communities. These are our families. Um, my, my dad was incarcerated for majority of my young adult life. Uh, for majority of my youth, uh, so it's personal, and I and I think that as a community we need to start having that conversation, and that's why I'm so grateful to have Joy and Destiny and Astro to share um, their experience uh, with policing in Hawaii and what does that look like. So yeah, want to unmute? Yeah, sure, no problem. I'll go first. Um, so I, I grew up with two parents who were disenfranchised. Both my parents were felons, um, so I actually had no education on civil work about voting about policing about what any of this really looked like or how we could make these changes because they just kind of avoided these topics in my house um, so for me it's really important to talk about policing and, and what that means and how that affects our communities because of what it can do intergenerationally when we don't have these conversations and when our families are impacted uh, by this system and we are not aware of the effects that the system um, has and I think that uh, Joy really brought a good point um, earlier today when she was talking about the history of this in Hawaii and how it's more intimate because um, that's our family up there. I mean, Joy, if you could go into kind of what we, you were talking about about that earlier, I think that was really important because not only are we experiencing violence within our communities, but like you, the way that you said it about it being intimate violence because these are our cousins, our brothers arresting us in this in this way. Um, that was really powerful. If you could share some more about about that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that we need to back up even further, you know, before we get into talking to the intimacy of being policed by our own uh, community or our other Kanaka, um, the, the very existence of the United States within Hawaii is predicated on the violent occupation by the U.S. military. And so we can't ignore the very foundation of the U.S. presence in Hawaii to begin with. And the way that that was also led by sugar barons. And when you start to connect that to, as slavery and sh sugar industry is, is starting to slow down in the American South, it is finding its way into the Hawaiian Islands and into the Pacific. Um, and so we're, we're basically looking at, and then you start seeing Southern penal laws being introduced into the Hawaiian and into Hawaii uh, in the early 20th century, you start seeing the criminalization of Hawaiian bodies uh, by these same um, folks coming into the kingdom. And so, and then as, as we get closer and closer to the overthrow in, 18, uh, in 1893, and as we're going toward uh, the so-called annexation of 1898, you start seeing these uh, political cartoons that come out that are making Hawaii, Cuba, the Philippines, Guam, Piccaninnies. Uh, we start seeing the making of Queen Liliuokalani and, and King Kalakaua as being seen as uh, identified as being compared to black, uh, right, in the same way that, that other black leaders are being turned into cartoonish monkey-like, right, uh, these sort of really racist, uh, you have McKinley, right, so going back to McKinley High School and McKinley's statue there, right, when we think about the foundations of, of what the U.S. occupation in Hawaii means, 
that is predicated on violence and policing. Then we have moved into a place where the labor options are become so limited for Hawaiians that it's either go into the plantation system, join the military, and then later on, if you're going to say Kamehameha schools, right? You, it's not a coincidence that many are, you know, you have ROTC and you have, uh, it's not a coincidence that many people come out and join the police force. These are the labor options available if you want to be able to buy a house or whatever. And so we've decided that the role of the state is not just because this is, you know, it's when we say that policing in Hawaii is different, you've actually convinced, you've, you've cut off nearly every option, right? So now it's either you're a criminal or you're on the other side of, right? Or you're, or you're defending the state who is actually defending its, its property, right? Um, let's not forget that Hawaii is strategically placed for the Pacific Command. Uh, and that, it and it is, it is this need to protect property. And Hawaii is unique in the sense that both the police and the military are pro are protecting property both domestically and throughout the Pacific. This is about uh, looking at uh, the role that police play and the role that the, the, a militarized police force play um, when we talk about. Uh, who, who's, we're looking at for capital. Mauna Kea is all about protecting a corporation. When we looked at what happened in Kahuku this summer, that was all about protecting a corporate wanting to build windmills. When we talk about, um, it is not an, do we really think that there's more Hawaiians in prison because Hawaiians are more violent than everybody else? Do we think that we have a disproportionate amount of black people compared to per capita in Hawaii because black people are more violent than everybody else? No, these are actual systemic laws. So when people question whether or not we have systemic racism in Hawaii, the very existence of the US in Hawaii is based on systemic racism and military occupation and the policing and containment, not just of Hawaiian bodies, but of all brown bodies within the Hawaiian islands. Uh, I'm sorry, I got very um, heated on that, but no, okay. I, think, I think that we, we have we have sort of forgotten that a little bit, and I want us to kind of snap out of these um, these narratives of like nicer policing. We don't need nicer policing. We we don't necessarily like uh, a reform, and we can talk about different reforms. But ultimately, what we're needing is to defund and ultimately find alternative ways for uh, restorative justice in Hawaii, which means d you need to def take the money away from the police and start putting into those things that we actually want to invest in. Healthcare, uh, housing, education, libraries, the arts, protect, you know, genuine security, right? Absolutely. And I, I think um, it's important too to, to yeah. remember the way that these policies directly affect um, community members, like some of the, the way that, I mean, Astro's story, I think is really, really impactful too, right? About yeah. how getting, getting um, charged at such a young age and how that impacts you as you go forward and, and what that looks like. If Astro could maybe speak to his story a little bit. Um. Hey, everybody. Um, basically, my story is one of a uh, young black male moved here back in 03 with my mom. Uh, dad stayed in Arkansas. So I grew up without really, you know, a father figure in the household. Mom uh, played both parts. Um, basically, you know, ran around around the time of like uh, when I was 19, 20, uh, wrong crowd, got myself involved into an armed robbery and I got arrested Dece uh, October, October 26, 2008. Um, there was, uh, when they pulled me in, obviously questioning all the stuff that came with it. But by the time that I was, to be sentenced, they offered me either 15 out of 20 or to take a youth defender plea, which is uh, open eight. That means zero to eight years. Uh, judge gave me the open eight. Um, I went to Halava and then they resentenced me and gave me seven completely out the gate. Uh, so there was no chance for me to uh, survive anything outside of the prison world that I was locked into. And then further from that, I was sent to Arizona um, in dealing with the mental issue, the mental health issues that arise with that and everything else. Um, I think one of the main points I missed was that when they did uh, lock me up, I was charged with a $100,000 bail. Um, and that was completely outside of my reach as where I was at that life, just as a 20 year old man trying to like work and do other stuff. like. 
I wasn't going to have $10,000 at that time. Uh, so obviously I didn't have uh, proper legal guidance as well. So it was a bunch of things that snowballed that lock a, locked myself into the system for a time. Yeah, and I think that that really speaks to a lot of the policies that we have in place. Cash bail, over-policing, over-sentencing, and like, we're talking about a 20 year old, that's, that's still a child. You know what I mean? There's so much growth and development that can be done there. And with, you know, correct programming and the correct community supports education, if the funding was going into these things and not militarizing our police system, think about how that could have changed your experience and how you could have learned and grown from that and not have been shaped um, from spending five to eight years behind bars. Thanks so, so much for sharing, uh, Astro. I know, like, for me, it, it, it's that thing of uh, finding the space and, like, honestly, sometimes even just, like, the courage to, like, okay, I'm going to open up and, and talk about some real shit. Um, and, you know, we talked about, like, cash bail for an, our position is that we, should, we need to end cash bail that the state needs to do its job to really assess whether someone is a seat like a you know as a safety risk to, to um, the community and uh, really and also bail is meant to make sure that people uh, show up to their next court hearing uh, and not not supposed to be a determiner of whether or not someone is incarcerated uh, so yeah is there we touched like joy you touched upon like so many things um, one of the things that like has really <laughs> resonated with me around like my work with incarceration is I came home uh, because of Mauna Kea. I saw what um, a militarized police force looked like and I saw what it looked like against uh, my own people and it was one that was really hard to reckon with uh, to see Kapuna arrested to see um, you know I use the, the pictures that are provided in this slide to really demonstrate like what was this response for? Like, why are so many of uh, police officers um, responding in this way? And it makes me think of a lot of like the peaceful protests that are happening on the continent. Um, that like, what would it have looked like? What, have, what would actual community policing look like? What would, uh, like, I, I still don't have a good answer. And no, I don't think that we'll, we'll get to one. <laughs> um, that I just know that the level of just aggressiveness that I saw uh, from videos and pictures from Mauna Kea is, n is not what I want to see coming out of Hawaii. Um, can I, if I could speak to that just a little. I was on the Mauna when the police were uh, there. And what people don't know is that the police were starting to mount from three days before that. Um, Ike had, had um, police flown in from Maui, flown in from Oahu. We were surrounded by the sheriff's department. There was also the National Guard was on standby, which the Kia'i absolutely refused to have National Guard come up the road. Uh, they tried to have trucks come up, uh, but the National Guard, um, like the, the police were sitting in National Guard tanks waiting to, I mean, they, these are not, um, we were looking at police, we were spacing down police that had four foot uh, batons and strapped with mace and, and very, serious militarized gear and this was mounting and mounting over the course of three days and people don't know the amount of de-escalation that we had to do um, as those police from the amount of negotiating and the amount of um, and you know like even though you know people say you know the police were respectful or showed restraint crying and arresting is still an arrest you know and how much more painful for those, like I flew over on a plane sitting next to a man that I saw the next day poised to arrest me. Um, so, I mean, I was literally sitting on the plane with the guy, with, you know, with somebody that looked like my uncle who was like next day in full suit, ready to go, um, you know? And so that, that reality, I think people, you know, are forget, like it, it, does, it, it only makes it harder it does it does it doesn't you know this this is not community community policing has never been the answer that means that you can what you arrest me on a bike and we know <laughs> we've tried we've tried um and we've seen how bike bikes were used in Kahuku. um we have tr every reform has been tried you 
this is not a reformable entity, right? It is needs, we need to look at serious taking away of funds. We need to seriously move those funds to spaces that actually prevent poverty, right? Yeah, we absolutely. To, we need to move yep. funds to those places that actually give people real options outside, like, all of this is tied to capital. Like the, the idea that, I mean, we can't trust that if a policeman commits a crime that he'll be arrested, one, and two, if, even if he is arrested, that he won't be acquitted. The riots that you're seeing across uh, the world right now are based on the fact that police have not been held accountable, are based on the fact that it came out of very much containing black and brown bodies, including indigenous bodies. So let's not forget what the police are actually there for, even if they come at you in an Aloha shirt. Right. They still got a gun on their hip. And like, right. let's, like, let's not get romantic about this, right? We need to be very clear that we can work with our families who may be police to really, let's, let's talk about putting, let's talk about other options for justice, for accountability. We need to start imagining other forms of accountability, right? And, let, and we can spend a whole nother hour talking about private prisons and what private prisons have done to people in Hawaii and the way that that seriously severed relationships between families and the way that they were isolating by the, by, uh, corp, uh, the Corrections Corporations of America. Let's not pretend that this is not about making money off of black bodies and brown bodies. That's so, all it is. Right? I just want to come back to Astro and like, He's, he's living, you know, this is an embodied experience for Astro, right? I've only worked, I've worked with prisoners coming out, right? I worked with a, an integration, reintegration program that was only working with folks who had done time for a long time. And many of them had been in Saguaro prison. And many of them were even in Oklahoma before their shoe got yeah. shut down. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, we, we cannot be hell bent on keeping, on criminalizing we need to figure out what justice looks like. And that is why the length, like we, we act like defunding and abolition is some sort of magical, like some horrible idea when, true, when the truth is we've been defunding education. We've been defunding everything. Yeah. So, why, so why are we not defunding the most violent apparatus in the, in the, in the country? I think that's something that you, you touched on. You were talking about accountability being really important. And for me, part of my personal story too is that um, I was actually arrested for uh, a DUI when I was 20 years old and I was sexually assaulted by the police officer that arrested me. And for me, that officer was later um, char arrested, charged and sentenced to prison time. He, he had to serve out a sentence. And I think that while that doesn't heal the problem, it doesn't, does, doesn't undo the damage that was done. There's some sense of, justice there some sense of restore like some sense of something being given back to me um, from that situation knowing that someone was held accountable for the crimes that were held against me and i i i think that it also ties into one of the questions that was put in the chat about talking about um can you be for black lives matter and still be against the abolition of police and i think that for me there's a language drift or like a, a misunderstanding in, in language i think that when we talk about um, defunding um, or abolishing police, what we're really talking about is exactly what Joy was just was speaking on. It's like, um, is taking, instead of taking money from these education, healthcare, community services, and and increasing the, the police budget, what we need to be doing is taking that money and reinvesting it into our community so that we can prevent these situations from even happening in the first place. Um, and I think that's part of this question that's up here that says someone asked them, can I be pro Black Lives Matter and yet against the abolition of police? And I feel like, to be honest, I was, I was a little bit confused about the phrasing of what that means, defund police, abolition. I didn't understand because as a survivor of sexual assault and domestic violence, I feel like I want to have, I want to be able to call someone. I want to know that I feel I have some kind of safety net and when I live at home alone as a, as a single female, you know what I mean? And so I was kind of nervous about that too until I did some research and started understanding what that really looked like and what that really meant. And I think that you're speaking on that quite well, Joy, um, about taking those, that money instead of increasing the budget of the most violent um, uh, department that we have in our state 
and, and continuing, continuing to give them money and militarize them, why don't we take those funds and educate our community so that we can prevent them from even needing to be policed? Mm. Right? <laughs> wow, that's so radical. Yeah. <laughs> Did Thank you. <laughs> I know that uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q and A, um, so kind of. Um, I pulled one. Can answer. Yeah, you answer, you did answer one. I think that was in the the uh, chat box. Okay. Um, and folks are right now asking around: um, Is there a movement to eliminate bail? Uh, why do we have cash bail? <laughs> uh, so, at ECLU, we've taken the stance that cash bail needs to end. Uh, the state does need to take, uh, needs to, has the burden to prove whether uh, someone is um, a threat to public safety. And if they are, then um, the state needs to handle that. But cap, bail should not be used uh, as a means to um, hold somebody indefinitely. Something uh, that, I, we, oh, sorry. You're good. Um, so there, we can, I think the movement starts here in this conversation with each other of like, what ways can we tackle cash bail and getting rid of it? Um, so yeah, I think it's here. I think it's in this room. So if there's a movement, it's right here. Uh, I know that in pre last legislative session, there has been strides made um, in, in terms of bail reform, but I know that we can go further. So I hope that, that answered it. Yeah, I know that something that I found interesting from the ACLU Smart Justice Report was the fact that um, sometimes oftentimes bail is kind of used as an putting someone in jail with a high bail is used as an incentive to get them to change their plea right like people are going in there they're being arrested saying i'm innocent i'm innocent they go into jail they're sitting in pretrial for however many days and the the environment in which they're being held in in pretrial which is overcrowded not safe um it makes them want to get out and say whatever they have to so i'll change my plea so that you drop my bail so that i can go home and I think that is um, just disgusting. I've seen that. I've seen that happen. They try to put people under uh, any type of uh, mental pressure or whatever, and they put you in OCCC. And nowadays, OCCC is three men to a cell. And a lot of times you're under 22 hour lockdown because there aren't enough staff or staff don't show up. Uh, or visits get canceled on the weekend, so you can't see your family. You have one phone call a day. All these things are put into place to get you to change that verdict. You know what I mean? It's not, it's tough, it's tough. Cool. Uh, we have another question around HPD handles their police within their own administrative review board. Uh, in most cases, and why officers are put on administrative really, uh, leave or probation. Uh, what are the steps a community can take to establish a community policing review board to check the authority of the law enforcement? Um, there, this is some of these questions are really great, but also <laughs> are going to take a lot. Like it's going to take. A, I'm, and I'm glad for these questions that are that are um, popping in. Uh, oh man, now people are just entering it in. Um, what does that sense? So one, contacting your lawmakers. Uh, and I think that we can, a lot of these questions I think will be answered in the second part of, or the third part of our discussion, where Destiny's gonna talk about some of the reforms that we're ta uh, taking through legislation. Um, and, and if you all see any of the questions and you wanna answer it, like, let me know. So I'm going to move on from this slide. And thank you, Joy and Astro and oh, Destiny. Yeah, because yeah, I see more people are popping in the questions. They're thinking. So let's let's start answering some of them. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I mentioned earlier that I came back home because of Mauna Kea. Um, and part of that was, a lot of that was because of this job uh, as a smart justice organizer. Uh, the, the job description said uh, that the first requirement that you were impacted by incarceration. And while I've never um, served any time, I know what it what what it's like to have a loved one um, behind bars. And during the Mauna Kea, I saw that there were legal observers from ACLU up there, 
and I had never read a job description or seen um, that something like that before. Um, and that meant to me that there were people looking out uh, for folks like my family that wanted to end mass incarceration and they wanted people like me and my dad to drive it. Uh, so I picked up the job description and packed up my bags and came back home. And what we talk about a lot now oops, with the Smart Justice campaign are the different uh, pillars that we're trying to tackle. So that sentencing bail, the prosecutor's race, um, parole and release, re-entry, and police policing. Around sentencing, uh, we believe that we must reduce both the number of people entering jails and prisons and the extreme laws and policies that drive extraordinarily long prison terms. Uh, bail, this one is going to continue to come up, that we need to overhaul the harmful, unjust, and for-profit bail system that needlessly locks up millions of people who have not yet been convicted of a crime um, simply because they can't afford to pay bail. Uh, when it comes to our prosecutors, it's made a lot of news, a lot of news with the scandals in recent years. Um, but we, we need to have like a community-wide reckoning that prosecutors are the most influential actors in the criminal justice system and across the country, these mostly elected officials um, work towards convictions and not justice. We're challenging the prosecutorial um, abuse in the courts and legislatures through voter education. So, uh, Later this week, we we sent out questionnaires to all of like the prosecutorial candidates in Honolulu and Hawaii Island uh, to see where they stand on really important issues. Like, do they actually acknowledge that there's implicit and uh, bias within the criminal legal system? Do they have a goal around decarcerating? Um, and like, what where do they stand on some juvenile justice issues? Uh, around parole and release. Hundreds of thousands of people, including those convicted of violent and nonviolent crimes, stay in prison for far too long because of a broken parole and release system. Uh, I know this very well because my dad, uh, I think uh, the shortest time he's ever spent out, he went back in after three days for missing a call with his parole officer, um, you know, a probation officer. And then around re-entry, and this one has been a big topic because of a COVID-related release, but each year, you know, People uh, return from prison and, to, and return from prison to their communities, and yet uh, the challenges do not end once uh, prison bars are lifted. There are so many legal job, housing, and healthcare restrictions placed on folks as if they don't need a place to stay, as if they don't need healthcare, as if they don't need a job um, after serving their time. And the last, the big one uh, that's been, that's why we're all here and talking about police reform. Um, and that looks really, a really big one, is a lot of my colleagues uh, across the country have worked as legal observers, have been educating protesters about their rights, they've been arrested, tear gassed and hit with rubber bullets, they've challenged curfews, organized town halls, talked to victims of police abuse and donated money to Black Lives Matter, uh, held a local bail fund, donated to local bail funds and strategize about transform, transformative change. Um, so like at ACLU, you're really busy, uh, but let, let's not forget this is happening during a pandemic and who's currently in the White House. Uh, and ACLU's advocacy against police violence uh, began in the 1920s, shortly after our founding. Um, we spearheaded a government report around the lawlessness in law enforcement uh, in 1931, in 1965, uh, we opened up our first storefront office to directly document police abuse. Um, and similar to what we're seeing today, um, in those demonstrations that were happening in the 60s, uh, black and brown youth are leading the charge for change. Uh, in, the, in the 1990s, uh, following the police beatings of Rodney King, ACLU launched a fight against racial profiling. Um, and uh, resulting in a lot of litigation and nationwide advocacy efforts. Um, and we continue into the 2000s to document uh, biased policing in places like Minneapolis, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, and Detroit. And, uh, have, and, and through a lot of these documents, have documented police departments that reserve their most aggressive enforcement for people of color generally and Black people in particular. 
So, and despite all of this work that ACLU has done to address police violence in communities of color, there's a fundamental truth that we must confront. Um, it hasn't worked. Pe Black people continue to be murdered and brutalized uh, by police with near impunity, uh, and more of the same just won't fix the problem. So as we look to the future, um, ACLU has united with the Movement for Black Lives um, to, for the fight to completely reimagine a completely reimagine and envision uh, the role, presence, and responsibilities of police in the U.S. Uh, the fight will be complex, but in practice, what we want can be clearly stated. We need fundamentally to change the role of police in our society, and that role needs to be smaller, more circumscribed, and less funded with taxpayer dollars, um, and any money, you know, Joy talked about this extensively, saved from reducing the size and scope of police departments must be reinvested into community-based services that are better suited to respond to our community needs. Um, doing so will foster improved safety and health outcomes uh, and present opportunities in black and brown communities for decades of underinvestment in everything like education, healthcare, housing, and transportation. Um, will and accept police has helped fuel this massive uh, mass incarceration crisis. Uh, and, we t and I won't go into it too much, but you know, we got, we have to reckon also reconcile with the fact that uh, the underlying pro with problem with policing isn't just the lack of oversight uh, policies, like more anti-bias training and better procedures like using a body camera, while radically, radically changing these uh, areas are essential for harm reduction. Um, the problem itself is more insidious. The core is modern policing itself. The original sin of policing in this nation is its attachment to the nation's first and most devastating sin, and that's chattel slavery. Uh, modern police forces in this country can be traced back to slave patrols uh, used in Charleston, South Carolina, and from their inception, police have been tasked with protecting power and privilege and property uh, by exerting social control over black and brown people. So when we, we need to talk, like that's, uh, when we talk about policing and its impact of, on communities of color, uh, it's the history of police is rooted in that. Um, so it's on all of us to really um, to reimagine and like be creative in our thinking of what policing will look for, what we're looking for in Hawaii's future, especially. Can I just say two yeah. things to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Real quick. Um, Hawaii, the, the reason I think people are like, well, Hawaii is different because we ended slavery in 1852. Um, we actually allowed people to be free when they got off the ships here. But that was because of the experience of our ali'i as they were crossing the United States and seeing that violence. That means that when they were trying to figure out labor and how to like criminalize Hawaiian bodies, they had to be more creative. Okay, um, it was still rooted. The th way the, uh, the eugenics and everything that came into the kingdom is still rooted in the ideas of chattel, like what happened when slavery ended, right? The same. So I I just want folks, especially Kanaka, to remember this that. Even though we, like, even though the Hawaiian kingdom very clearly was like, we're not having this, we, you're not gonna annex our kingdom, you're not gonna, we're not gonna have uh, slavery here. That means that the white people that were here, the, the sugar barons and stuff, we're trying to, like, we're making moves to figure out other ways to do it. Uh, and that we, and we also cannot deny that there was black birding throughout the Pacific uh, that happened with, um, uh, that was using those black, black bodies of Melanesia and in Samoa as well to use on Australian farms. And, and some, of, some Hawaiians are actually kidnapped in that. Um, so I, I just want folks to just kind of like, remember that even though things on many ways are very different in the Hawaiian kingdom, it's because of the Hawaiian kingdom that we were make, trying to make interventions into what would have very, very much been a slave space. Um, and if, if it had not been for Hawaiian intervention and us determining that Black Lives Matter in 1850s, because we were marked as black bodies, that that is exactly why Hawaiians today in the kingdom need to stand up for Black Lives Matter now, right? Because we have always done that, because we have always protected black bodies, including our own. 
And so I just, I just needed to add that a little bit in terms of when we tie this to chattel slavery and we say, oh, we're not connected to that. Yeah, we are. We really, really are because we were making moves to intervene against it. Okay, so anyway, just go, and we can go back to reform. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for naming that. Um, I know for me coming back home has, it's been a deep dive into like learning like into US history and like how, how, do, how do we all play into that? How does Hawaii play into that? Um, so just again, our, the goals of the vision around um, ending police violence means, you know, it's time to embrace alternatives like civilian-led crisis intervention teams comprised of highly trained professionals, including nurses, doctors, psychiatrists, and social workers uh, to respond to incidents with people who are in mental health crisis. It's time to put more counselors and teachers, not police, into our schools. It's time, it's time especially here in Hawaii, to stop criminalizing families experiencing houselessness. Um, this is the future that's worth fighting for. Um, and reducing the funding to police departments and reinvesting those funds back into black and brown and indigenous communities are necessary steps to prevent further harm and to restore the promise of, you know, our constitution and our, 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 our protected rights and civil liberties. So um, I think there are a lot of steps that we can take. Um, and I want Destiny to take this one away and talk about some of like the reforms that we're fighting for right now and the steps that folks can, can do and take um, in the next, in the coming weeks. So I know that during um, some of the different demonstrations that we've had, the marches, a lot of people were asking, um, okay, but what can we do here locally to, to make change in our own communities? And although there are so many things that need to go on um, over, that will take a lot of time, like reimagining and rethinking what police actually look like and what that, how they police our communities or if they're needed or, or all of these questions, how we, how we look at that. While we're in that process, there are some smaller steps that we can take um, to kind of help reform right now, help make change right now. And one of the, one of the bills that uh, you could support is HB 2750, which is, um, it's the stopper bill. Basically a driver's, license, a driver's license stopper happens when you have um, fines that you haven't paid. And um, after a certain amount of time, these fines go to collection. Um, once they've gone to collection, your, they send that report back to the state and your driver's license gets revoked. You're driving your car, you get pulled over for, I don't know, maybe running through a stop sign and you end up ultimately arrested. Um, this is a direct uh, penalization of, being, of poverty. This is, um, it directly impacts people who have a uh, low socioeconomic status and basically you're putting them in jail for not being able to pay for a fine, um, which then they'll have a bail, which they can't pay for. So here we go again, um, policing uh, poverty. Um, the next bill is, um, it's House Bill 1782, it's companion bill is the Senate Bill 2193. Um, this is relating to employment discrimination. So uh, I call it the look back bill. I think ACL, ACLU calls it the look back bill too. Um, for me, this one's really personal actually. I recently um, was trying to, was thinking about joining the um, Peace Corps and they have to do a background check. And they, um, found some stuff in my background that was over seven years old. And I had a whole moment of, uh, I had a whole breakdown. I started crying and feeling like I couldn't outlive a crime that I had, or a mistake that I had made when I was 20 years old. Um, so basically this bill will reduce the look back period to three years for misdemeanors and five years for felonies. Um, because if once you've been, I think that's really important because once you've been incarcerated and they, we talk about reentry, right? And reintegrating into society and wanting to start our lives over. How can we do that if we're constantly being um, held, uh, held, held, kind of having this mistake held over our head for years and years after we've already done the time, can't we outlive this mistake already? Um, so this is another one that you can support the look back bill. Um, And then these next two are, um, def are police or reform, police reform bills, um, public safety bills, accountability. This first one is HB 285, um, which basically requires um, the police department, county police departments to uh, report to the legislature um, 
any officer who has been suspended or discharged and also allows for public access to information on these suspended officers. So for me, again, accountability is, is huge. And one of the reasons that we were able to hold um, George Floyd's murderers accountable for their actions is because we knew who they were. We knew the actions that they had taken and us as a, not just a, their local community, but as a national community, we said no. And we all chanted that they be held accountable for the things, uh, the crimes that they committed. In Hawaii, we don't know when people do stuff wrong. Um, it's very under the table, hush, hush, no one has to tell anyone. So a police officer who is still on the force, maybe he was suspended for a little while, pulls you over, he could, um, it could have had a an incident previously that that you don't you don't know about. I think it's important to know who's policing our communities. Um, HB two zero six nine. Uh, this one's a, another one that I think is extremely important. They're all really important, but this one. Let me just talk about it for a second. Okay, so this has to do with um, the civil forfeit um, situation. Basically, when you are charged with the crime. You, your property can be seized and um, ultimately forfeited over to the public safety department, uh, regardless of whether you have been convicted of this crime or not. So this bill would require that seized property only be forfeited after a conviction. Um, it also required that the state would require that the state prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, in addition to which right now, when this property is seized and forfeited to the public safety department, it goes into a, a bucket of unrestricted funds. They are sitting on millions of dollars that they have no um, guidelines on what they can and cannot use that money for. So what this bill would also do is require that those funds, any funds that are forfeited to, public, um, to the public safety department for a uh, crime, be allocated to education which I think is really important, what we've been talking about, defunding and reallocating funds to education, healthcare, community um, systems. This is a big one that would help that. So thank you so much, Destiny, because <laughs> uh, I know those are the, a lot of the major bills and folks are asking right now, what can we do um, to like show our support for this bill? What does supporting this bill look like? So next Monday, um, um, 22nd, the legislature will actually be reconvening. Um, they had to recess because of uh, the stay at home order. Uh, but right now, you can go to this link, uh, bit.ly, and then two slash 2y68y40. Um, and it will take you to a form where you can contact your legislators um, and let them and ask them to please hear these bills. Um, and we'll be sending this in, uh, sending more information about these bills in a follow up email uh, after this webinar. So you can talk to them because what we need right now, they're going to reconvene and they have a set amount of time that they can dedicate to um, hearing these bills. So you really want to make the case um, that it's important for them to hear these bills, that we need criminal legal reform right now, that this is what we're being called upon by Black uh, leaders and community and the Black Lives Movement to, to uh, transform our communities in one where we have a police accountability, where we have, uh, or, where there, we don't have, our police departments aren't sitting on millions of dollars of unrestricted funds to buy things, they can buy anything with it, like uh, TVs or Nintendo Switches. Um, so if you go to this link, you can contact your legislator. Um, you can be vocal on social media. Um, you can, uh, ACLU Hawaii, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram and Facebook. Um, talk about these issues. Share from our um, social media pages. Um, you can also vote. Uh, do you, are you registered to vote? Do you know who you're voting for in 2020? Do you know who you're voting for for prosecutor in 2020? Um, these are all things that we need to be talking about and thinking about. Well, I'm going to. And also know that that's not enough. Yeah. We need to be thinking about these things, but that's not enough. Yes, that's not even just the beginning. That's not, that's not even scratching. That's like like scratching kind of an itch. It's not enough. So I, 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 I really want us to be wary of people throwing concessions at us, right? Right now, they'll let us do almost anything, right? Now they're going to review all their policies. Now they'll let us paint Black Lives Matter in the street. Maybe not in Hawaii. I don't know. <laughs> But they're going to throw this at us, and we can't be blinded by that trickery. So I just want—I just want to really remind us that all of these things are great, 
Um, I, and, I, and I support this, but I also want us to remember that it's not enough and we cannot live here. We need to push and push and push until we actually have alternatives to the prison industrial complex, to this carceral state that is on the rise, to this military industrial complex that has been, that really is what holds the purse strings of Hawaii. When, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry, I know we have other stuff to go to, but I just, I just wanna say that I'll let you go back to this, but I just wanted to chime in a little bit on that. No, I think that's, I think that's totally important, totally important and extremely valid. Um, that was, I was kind of trying to touch on that before I went into the, to the bill spiel. Just, um, I know that these bills are important. They can help with the push some things right now, but like Joy was saying, like it's barely the beginning and it's, I don't want us to live there. It's a, it's an avenue, a tool for us to get, make a little leeway but um, it's, there's so much more that we've got to do. Awesome. Yeah, we can be, there's, a, there's so much more. And like having these conversations are just the beginning. Uh, we're like, let's see, let's go to the next slide. Um, and so for folks who, I think a lot of it is also like taking back a lot of our, our sharing our voice and sharing our power and their stories because your voice is important. Um, so next Monday, we'll be doing another webinar on an advocacy training on like, what does it look like to talk to your legislator to testify um, on these important bills and to put the pressure on them um, to hear these really four critical important bills that like, we're not even asking for them to support it. Like we want them to support it, but we just need them to also be heard. Uh, they're going to be there. They're convening for just a very short amount of time. So um, look out for in our follow-up email on how to RSVP um, next Monday at, on the 22nd for um, a uh, advocacy training on people not prisons. Um, lastly, this is the last page and, and we can close out soon, maybe do some more Q&A. Uh, here are some resources for folks on how to get more information around all the topics that we talked about tonight. You can visit aclu.hawaii.org. Um, you can look at our bail study. Some of, a lot of the facts and figures that we mentioned tonight are, are in that bail study. Um, we also have a page on reporting police misconduct. Uh, uh, we have a really handy uh, First Amendment toolkit where if you have questions around planning demonstrations or protests, uh, we even go through like in what areas if you're planning a demonstration would you need a permit or not, um, and then also a link to the, the Hawaii Community Bail Fund. I also threw the link for the um, drop form into the chat if anyone wants to follow that link. It's a quick way to go ahead and contact um, legislatures about some of the bills that we were talking about today. And I, and I also just want to say for folks who are interested in this larger conversation around defunding um, you know, in, the, in an international context, I would say look at the Movement for Black Lives uh, website um, where they talk about it extensively. There's a webinar and also uh, the Rising Majority uh, website. And then I would also look at the 619, which is the Juneteenth 619.com. It also has several actions planned if you're thinking about um, these, these, these larger issues around how do we get, when we, there was a lot of questions about, well, we say defund and we say we're going to abolish the police, what are the steps for that? And so there's larger conversations going on, um, trying to get us three folks or us four folks to answer all these major, huge questions is a little bit tricky, but there are people in international conversations about this. Um, and so I would, I would definitely look into those sites as well, um, because there's a lot of conversation about this and what are the steps to take there. Thank you. I think I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen. And like, let's like uh, plug away at some of these uh, questions here. Okay, cool. Yeah, answered a couple of them. So you're good. Everyone, if you have, if you sign up through our website, uh, you'll have access to um, the alerts that we put out. Uh, we'll put a link to um, this webinar uh, in case you missed part of it. Um, and also to the, um, the PowerPoint itself and, so, and information, further information about these bills.
So I think that answered quite a bit. And then we also, yes, so could we post some of uh, some of the stats in policing and Hawaiian social media? Yep. Uh, we're working on boosting up our social media presence. So definitely when we share out, feel free to share it into to yours as well. Um, F, will the prosecutor survey, the ICO you sent out to candidates be available for public view? Yes. Uh, will we look for that um, in this com in later this week? other questions. I'm trying to find ones that maybe y'all could answer. Um, I know. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Destiny, I think they said the link doesn't work. The bit.ly one? Yeah, I threw in the um, the job form one instead just because I I don't have the keys to that bit.ly one. That's a Shana, I think. Sorry. It's okay. Sorry. Cool. So use the job form. I'm trying questions? to, I'm trying to look through the Q and A. Some of these are really big, really big questions. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these questions, yeah, I'll get. I can email you and reach out to you personally because um, some of them might require uh, more further research. Um, I mean, they're like a webinar oh. all in themselves. Yes. Some of these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so who would you like? If anyone for mayor, for DA, city council. Sorry for jumping ahead. So. Uh, ACLU, we do not endorse candidates. Uh, we educate. So um, we like we are, want to talk about the prosecutor's race, but we don't take stances on who you should vote for. But if anything, you should just vote. <laughs> you should vote and you should be in, in, uh, educated on why you're voting for that person. Do you believe this person, um, you know, has, has the goals in mind regarding decarceration around um, addra addressing the racial disparities of the system? Mm -hmm. Cool. There's a question that says something about um, under what conditions can the police currently seize property pre-conviction. I know there's a list of charges where um, that is applicable. I don't know exactly the... Oh, is that Monica? Is she going to answer this one? <laughs> oh, I guess not. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool, yeah. Some of these questions, y'all have really good questions tonight. <laughs> uh, let's see, yeah, I will reach out because I have your email. I'll reach out and uh, personally email you. Um, but we are a bit over seven o'clock and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. If maybe uh, Joy and um, uh, Astro and Destiny, do you have any like closing thoughts, anything that you want folks to walk away with or takeaways? Um, I recently found out that felons in the state of Hawaii can vote, provided they are off parole. Yeah. Uh, I recently, I, before this meeting, I signed up myself to vote for the first time. Uh, so oh. I've been advocating that ex-felons, you can vote. Don't let people tell you you can't. That's actually, yeah, sure. that's actually a major thing because uh, one of the key ways that they have prevented change reform, I mean, change happening in the, in the U.S. is by preventing uh, prisoners from voting. So I think that's amazing. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. I think just as a closing thought, um, we need to keep our eye on the bigger, on the bigger issue. We need, like, we always need to remember that racism is a distraction. And that in while we're over here fighting off of some off of some you know historic like all this historic um, uh, conditioning that they've done to us, they've been gutting the economy, they've been taking away labor, uh, they've been attacking unions, they have been um, increasing, they've increased a never-ending war. Um, we're you know like they're trying to have RIMPAC in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, which brings 25 countries from around the world, right? Um, we we need to think about when we're on when when we're being sidetracked, 
by this kind of stuff and that's being led by the highest office in the in the in the so-called US that in the middle of all of this they were gutting the EPA in the middle of all this they were um they're trying to to increase uh control over capital so I just want us to really remember that that when we get um when people say these things are impossible to end uh, that's exactly what you want us to think. They don't want us to imagine a world without them. And so we are here to imagine a world without them. Okay. And so we can do these little half steps, but the, the ultimate goal is to find alternatives to capitalism and alternatives to a system that is, that has been ki trying to kill us for four centuries. Okay. I'm just going to end on that. Mahalo. <laughs> I, I agree. This isn't. Um, this is not something new. This has been happening for a long time. I think what's new is our cell phones and social media. And so um, I think that a lot of our friends, maybe the the people that aren't on this call right now, um, don't understand. They don't like. They don't get it. Um, I'd offer them a book, <laughs> or the hand. I don't know, but <laughs> or cut them off. I don't know. Tell them to read a book, though. This is a this lot is of books. Old. Yeah, a lot, plenty of books. <laughs> we, read a, we got a list. Um, so that's that's what I'd like to say is that this is not something new. Um, this is this is very old. It's been in our history for a long time. And to our friends who didn't get on this call for whatever reason, um, just remind them of that and offer them some education and knowledge into our history in this country. Um. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for, you know, we put together this call like really quickly. Some of us only knew about it this morning. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and like this is to have, uh, you know, further, I'm glad that we're continuing to have this conversation and pushing this conversation forward. I want to thank you all for your time. Um, I will be sending in follow-up email with all the information that was discussed and disseminated during this presentation. Um, if, and I'll ask if, like, you know, presenters, if you'd also I can include your social media links so folks can follow you and your work uh, moving forward. So yeah, thank you, Mahalo.